Hello, my name is Clara Mavella and I set up the Cultural Entrepreneurship Institute here in Berlin. Today, Gunther Bachmann is my guest. He is General Secretary of the German Council for Sustainable Development. Welcome, Mr. Bachmann. Guten Tag, uh, Dr. Hello, Bachmann. Dr. Bachmann. <laughs> it's great that you've taken the time to be with us. Would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, I'm Secretary General of the Council for Sustainable Development. I've been doing that since 2001, when the Council was first set up. Before that, I worked for the German Environment Agency, where I was responsible for issues such as soil conservation, groundwater quality. I trained as a landscape designer and soil conservationist. So I come from the very depths of environment conservation protection. And for almost 15 years now, I've been responsible here for sustainable development as Secretary General to a group of people who are appointed by the Federal Chancellor. There are 15 members of the Council coming from all walks of life, all sectors of society. The churches have representatives, trade unions, environment groups, development policy, local councils, big companies, small and medium-sized companies, every three years we get new appointments and this body is responsible for advising the federal government and I organize it. Fantastic, so you are Secretary General of the Council for Sustainable Development. Let me ask you, what is so special about this very honorable position? I think the special aspect to it is the fact that this council was ever appointed in the composition it has. You can only understand that if you look at all the things we tried to do before that didn't work. In Germany, like all countries around the world, since the early 1990s, we have had the remit to contribute to sustainable development and preferably to have a strategy with targets, long-term ideas, but also specific measures to be taken by the state as well. And in the 1990s, Germany tried this in a few ways, but somehow never managed to get it right. There was resistance in the cabinet. There was a general lack of interest, and perhaps we had the wrong approach at the time. And then around the year 2000, the German government at the time decided to adopt a different approach. They said, let's organize a committee, this Council for Sustainable Development, which offers us advice from society itself. How can you do that? How can you establish a consensus which is woven into society and which relates to the fact that people don't want to do things the way they used to? You're trying to change behavior across society. We call it a sustainability strategy. And at the time, this Council for Sustainable Development was first set up. Secondly, it was decided that it has to come from the top. Government leaders, in our case, that would be the Chancellor of Germany, has responsibility to ensure this happens. The Chancellors come to our meetings, ask questions and answer our questions. We have a regular exchange, not only with the Chancellor, but with the Committee of Secretaries of State. They come from all the ministries that have anything to do with it. They get together regularly, think about it and decide what the government can contribute within its own sphere of competence. Then there are also committees at local level. We have one committee, for example, with 28 mayors from big cities around Germany who think about what they can contribute. And we have industrial companies asking these questions. We have local campaign groups. We have Werkstatt N, that's a workshop which looks every year at hundreds of local projects from around the country. It's a place where they can experiment with their kind of backshed solutions on sustainable development and, for example, about saving food to prevent food waste or learning. How do you teach people in schools about sustainable development or in youth centers? Or what are we going to do with all those plastic bags? These concrete questions. And all this is initiated and, let's say, 
stimulated, encouraged by the Council for Sustainable Development, and that's new, that kind of committee. We've learned in the past, and we've seen again and again, advisory boards with very clever people, experts, who advise a minister. And then something changes, not necessarily better. But we have a committee that advises the Chancellor, the Chancellor's office or Chancellery and also the ministers, but can also run its own projects, can talk with society, have ideas of its own, and we are not accountable for these to the government. So we have, if you like, a new kind of committee here. We have a little working group here at the office with a few of my colleagues where we have a little budget to organize things like that. And that is what is new. So that is a new positioning. What was decisive for you? What brought you to where you are now? For example, what role is played here by curiosity or a search for meaning? Well, I used to work for the Environment Agency, as I said, on soil conservation, and we drew up a completely new law then. The soil was the element that was most neglected. We had laws on air quality, water quality, on waste, on conserving the natural landscape. We did all those in the 70s. But we didn't do this for soil conservation. And when I noticed that, when someone drew, drew my attention to it, it was curiosity and also a certain amount of outrage, thinking, how come we're organizing protection of the environment here and there, but we're doing nothing about this neglected element, the soil, where all this waste ends up and contaminates. So there was a mix, I suppose, of asking what's happening there, what's happening in this soil, I can't look at it so easily. What is happening in the natural sciences, what is happening in technology, and why in this society is such an important good, the soil from which we all live, that we stand on, literally, and we're not looking after it. Why in this modern knowledge society? So it was those two things, I suppose, a certain amount of outrage and also this curiosity. What's happening here? And at the time, with my modest contribution, we drew up this new act, despite all the resistance, and ultimately a decision was made that I might fill this post, because it calls for an approach which means daring to do things that haven't been done in the past. But also, you need a great deal of knowledge. You need to understand the things you're talking about. I don't need to know all the details, but I do need to know who to ask. And a certain amount of passion in dealings with people. This issue of sustainability has to be put across on a soapbox in the marketplace, not only in the seminar room. And it's also about, how can I put it, there's a certain emotional dimension to it. Because if you only come along as a scientist, if you like, as a cold-headed bureaucrat talking about techniques of sustainability and new products, or the service life of buildings, then you find the issue slip away in your face fingers because you're not reaching out to people. But if you think empathy, if you talk about the poetry and link that to sustainability, maybe you have a bit of an opportunity to reach people. Of course you need the technical foundations, they are important, but it will be easier to put things across. I'll give you an example if you don't mind. 300 years ago, we realized, actually last year it was 300 years, in 1713, a man in the former electorate of Saxony wrote the first book addressing the issue of sustainability. As thick as this, it was about forestry. If you like, I know this is comparative, but... Uh, if you like, he was the Minister of Trade and Industry for the Elector of Saxony. And the minister said, 
The way we are running our economy at the moment, the way the elector of Saxony is using his resources, spending his riches, we can't continue doing this. We're wasting wood. We're going to run out of wood. Now, this shortage of timber was everywhere at the time. There was simply too little wood about to generate precious metals, smelting ores, of course, to run the mining industry and to heat people's homes and buildings. They were running out. The woods were being cut down and they began to realize that the wood wasn't growing fast enough to replace itself. Problem, what do we do now? And this Jacques, this fiery polemic, this thick book that he wrote at the time, uses this term, sustaining, once. But the meaning of it, the attitude adopted by this gentleman, Karl von Karlowitz, had an impact. People started to say, okay, if we do something, if we carry on doing something that it is not going to continue in the future, that can't be continued in the future, we'll end up in chaos. And that idea, I suppose, slumbered for 300 years or so. There was the Industrial Revolution, there were the wars and so forth, and the wealth of the current world. But we can see there is a root here. And if you like, last year it was really important to reprint that book with some new forewords and prefaces. What was all this about? What were they thinking? What impact has this had over time? If you go into the church in Chemnitz with the baptismal stone of Karlovitz and you speak at the place of his baptism and explain to 400, 500 people in the church what was happening then, the Thirty Years' War had just ended, there had been depopulation of huge swathes of land, they wanted to boost the economy again. And of course, mining was important to the Saxon economy, but they suddenly realized there were boundaries, there were limits to economic growth. We have the same today. It's a bit more complex. We're not talking about local problems anymore, but about the planet as a whole. But if you explain it like that, then you reach a kind of cultural dimension. And you can explain that even to children. You can explain that to children by talking about chocolate. It comes from West Africa and the production is breaking down because of wars, because of poor labor conditions. You can explain it to anybody, whether it's cotton and t-shirts, where we pay 13 cents per t-shirt as wages for the seamstresses in Bangladesh, which is crazy, and which is over-exploitation, both of the environment and of people. If you explain it in those terms, then you get this high level of empathy in the discussion. The technical aspects, the catalysts, the desulfurization, the denitration of power plants, this is all important. We have to do it. We need to find new ways of producing and photovoltaics and renewable energies. But we have to convey it in such a way that people recognize, oh, I'm part of this and I'm a positive part of this. I can do something. This is also a task for our council. I think it's excellent that you've explained where this word sustainability comes from. And you're talking about forestry here. The idea is that you can only use the amount of wood that you can then plant again. A lot of people these days talk about sustainability, but what a lot of people mean is growth or sustainable growth of whatever. How do you see this? How do you work for the future generations? What is your focus in the Council? I will very happily answer that wonderful question, but first of all, let me say something about forestry and managing resources. This is one principle underlying sustainability. Use as much as you can regenerate. Make sure that you replant it. A second basic thought, and that isn't from Mr. von Karlowitz, it's from our modern period, that is cycles. Or loops where you recover things. And this is another important aspect 
to sustainability. Nature works in cycles, in loops. There is no waste. At the most, something will be left over and which is buried under the ground for thousands of years and then we dig it up, pump it out again as oil. But usually nature works in cycles, in loops. There are no limits to growth. So this idea of organizing the loops by recycling, by recovering things, feeding things back in with the sharing economy is the second great pillar on which the idea of sustainability is based. And if I look at the world, we have almost 9 billion people. Increasingly there are restrictions that derive from climate change, which will affect the way we use soil, agriculture, the way people live. And we have a shortage of resources, whether mineral resources, rare earths, other things too, but also usable land, land that can be farmed. These things are in short supply. And this results in a planet where it's becoming increasingly difficult to manage things the way we have in the past. It's hard enough already. We have already overstepped the boundaries that nature defines for us, clearly overstepped them. But people aren't going to stop doing that, so it's not enough to manage the resources. We also have to think in these loops and recycle the things that we have taken out of the earth. And cycles are completely different from waste. 40% of the food that is grown all across the world, great effort, a lot of work goes into that, a lot of resources, and it's thrown away. What kind of craziness is that? We could do these things much better, especially for people in the South. We could improve their opportunities in life if we didn't throw so much away. Then we wouldn't have to put so much pressure on the land. We could pay fairer wages. So this idea of the loop, recycling, resources is an important thought and that's why I would say from that point of view there is no limit to growth. We can grow sustainability because we would follow a natural path of growth. Of course people in Africa, Latin America, Asia have a right to live the way we have been living or they believe they would like to live this way. Certainly an absence of hunger, an absence of poverty, they have a right to that. And they have a right to a richer calorie intake per day. We have a problem with that. We are rich, we are full up, probably too full up, because we already now have problems like obesity and overeating if you like. And one little solution to that would be to say, okay, let's go back to the world of the Sunday roast. I don't need to eat meat every day. The Sunday roast was delicious. So if in cultures we introduce these little corrective adjustments, we could achieve a great deal. We could think in terms of cycles, and our world, our production, our consumption could be oriented to this principle. And then we will see fair, just growth for all. They have the right and we are able to achieve this worldwide. So if you like, it's Karlovitz Plus. The old idea of managing your resources plus the new idea of thinking in cycles. And the result is what we have to organize today, but we're still so far removed from doing sustainability. And now your question, who are we seeking to reach with this? How do we go out and talk to people about this? I have to say, it's not my task, and nor do I have the budget, the resources to reach everyone. We can't carry out a mass advertising campaign. We can't send mailings to every house. We can't go into all German schools and or write to them and say, you need to do this, this and this. We don't have the resources for that, but we can show them a few examples of things they could do.
And these demos can be used to encourage others to come up with their own contribution. And I think that's how sustainability has to work. I'll give you a concrete example, just one of many. I ran a competition once where I was looking for photographers who would give me a portrait photograph of somebody anywhere in the world who had earned particular credit in the field of sustainability and somebody had a photo of a Tibetan who was picking bits of plastic out of Tibetan rivers and another photographer brought a photograph of a young woman from Windhoek in Namibia who had been raped, as a result had been infected with HIV and in her town had then set up a centre for young girls to educate them about HIV AIDS. And that photograph won the competition. Then we invited this young lady from Windhoek to come to Berlin and she stood up there on the stage with the photographer and we had also invited two classes of school children from Berlin aged about 13, 14, 15 and they had spent a month having dancing lessons which we had funded. And they reenacted the story of that woman from Namibia up on the stage with an audience of a thousand people. Now, one can only hope that that is the beginning of something. Firstly, there is an emotional aspect to it, and it puts information across because people get involved with the issue. You need to ask yourself what is sustainable development in a country like Namibia? What are the elementary needs which need to be fulfilled? Before you can start talking about the city of the future or the water supply of the future, and what's that got to do with us? How do we identify with this issue? And the means to the end were to go into two classes, as it was in Kreuzberg and in Neukölln, which are boroughs in Berlin, and say, would you like to join in with this? And the benefit for the kids was they got a professional dance teacher and learned something. And some of them, some of those school students decided to carry on doing that later, decided they might like to become professional dancers. So for the children, there was a huge benefit, and there was a benefit to us too, because it showed us. We learned through the children and through the photographer and through the story from Namibia how we can present sustainability so that it's not in a seminar room but on the street. That is fascinating. I have a question. You've talked about how you want to communicate those ideas to the outside world. But what about the inside? You are a council. You are the secretary general of this council. The council has meetings, has offices. You consume things. How do you implement these issues practically? Well, we've been on a learning curve, I have to say. When we began, we did our first major events. We simply brought in caterers. There was stuff to eat and drink. In the meantime, when we run events, we don't offer meat. They are vegetarian events. And the water is in jugs, not in... It's not bottled water. It was a long struggle to be able to do that. So we have sustainability management that we have evolved for our own events. And I'm delighted that as a result of that, others have been encouraged to do this as well. Other organizers of events. For example, they go to the German rail operator Deutsche Bahn and they get a green ticket for people coming to the event or they decide to dispense with extra paper so that we don't all drown in red tape, in too much paper. And when it comes to the food and drink, they take care to ensure that what they are offering matches the theme of the event. 
It's broader than that. We look to see whether the ways in which we bring people together in our dialogues match the topic. So from that point of view, we try to do this on a small scale. And here in my office, I also have these flasks of tap water. We don't have the fizzy water in bottles. We use the train wherever we can. The big issue is how can I, as an individual, contribute to this? And we have what we call our sustainable shopping basket. If you go out and look to see what people buy, and you look to see whether there are quality labels on those products to say they are sustainable, We've drawn up a list of all these things and we distribute it as a brochure for consumers so that they can recognize the quality labels involved when they're buying day-to-day -day goods, but also furniture or financial services or tourism. They can then make a distinction. They can say, I don't need to take the brochure out to the shop because there are rules of thumb. I can see whether, for example, fruit and vegetable is seasonal. That's always better than fruit and vegetable that's been in storage. Things that are packaged should make way for things that are unpackaged when you buy vegetables. So you have these simple rules of thumb, and we've put these ideas together in the brochure. And we are guinea pigs ourselves. We try things out ourselves. And then you see, okay, then uh, we are only part-time saints. You can't always manage to do these things. Sometimes you take a taxi. There are business trips where you have to fly. There's no other way, especially if you're leaving Germany. But okay, then that's how it is. You just have to think about how aviation itself can be edged towards greater protection of the environment. Politically, we can do these things, but these individual questions still play a part. It's also about credibility and it's about experimenting for yourself. And then you respond differently to people. If someone says to you, mm, sustainability is no fun, you have to try to be empathetic. You have to try to show them how doable it is, but also tell them, this isn't just a Christmas list, this is a serious business. It's not just something you do at the weekend. You need to do it on Mondays as well, at your workplace, in your company. And that's why a few years ago, I think it was seven years ago, we started a big campaign around the German Sustainability Prize for companies, but now we also do it for cities and local councils, where we say, Right, we need to look at the positive things that are happening when, for example, a company adapts its production to go more sustainable or decides to pay fair wages in Asia. If a company says, I want my entire product chain to be derived from sustainable produce because I don't want to sell pizzas that aren't sustainable. What can we do? We can praise them, we can commend them, we have a prize, we have a stringent jury, there's a detailed application process, you have to provide a lot of data, and ultimately someone stands up there and has won the prize. So you have to develop a culture and make these successes and these awards visible, because sustainability isn't something you should do in a tight-lipped way, as a dictate. It's something you have to do yourself with all the restrictions and self-restrictions. I talked about the part-time saint. But you also have to develop it together with other people. And then it helps to praise other people for the things they are doing well. This kind of understanding for sustainability is an idea I would certainly like to encourage, that we don't tell people what to do, but we encourage them to take their own steps. And, working together with others, we commend them when they do things that are commendable.
Let's stay in your office for a moment before we move on to other questions. Why is that painting crooked? Not metaphorically speaking, of course, but literally, why are the paintings crooked? What is the backstory? One painting is crooked, the others are all straight. And this one painting is one that I brought with me from home because I moved and the elderly lady who moved out of that apartment left me this voluminous floral painting and I always hung it in my offices and for a long time it was straight. And then I had a visit from a group of Indonesian activists who were engaged around the whole issue of palm oil and orangutans and how our consumption was leading to the erosion of their forest and we were talking about things like belief and ethical principles and they said we have evil spirits and we have a way to deal with that because evil spirits are particularly keen on sitting on the frames of paintings because they can sit there and manage what's going on in the room so if you hang your painting at an angle they slide off and they can't disseminate their evil magic around the room so i thought okay so one painting has to be wonky here and it's that one lovely story you worked with klaus topfer on the report of the ethics commission on energy supply and the nuclear phase-out, which was part of the German energy transition. Can you tell us about that? That was after the nuclear reactor in Fukushima blew up, after the earthquake and the tsunami, and the nuclear power plant there blew up, and the Chancellor of Germany decided that she wanted to set up a task force of people who would advise her on the future of the nuclear energy industry in Germany. And it was a mixed group. There were people in favor and people against nuclear energy. And we had eight weeks. My job was to structure the discussion and to write up the report to find the compromise formulae which everyone could sign off. And we ended up by saying, yes, we can phase out nuclear energy in Germany within 10 years. We have the possibility of doing that. And if you have the possibility, you should do it. Nuclear power stations are safe. That was what we believed at the time. And therefore, we can switch them off. Because if you wait until a nuclear power plant is no longer safe, then you have to come up with something else. You can't just shut them down. You have a real problem. You can decommission them while they're still safe. And we thought in 10 years we'll be able to offer alternatives to the market. That was the idea. And this had to be formulated in wording in a report that was published by the Ethics Commission here in Germany. And that was the basis for what we now call the energy transition in Germany. It's this big effort that we undertook. First of all, to secure our energy supply. Secondly, not to do that at the expense of protecting the climate, but to achieve those tough targets we've set ourselves in Germany and indeed to encourage those, to support those and not hinder them. And thirdly, to do it without nuclear power. So we have this nuclear exit pathway until 2020 or 2022 when we want to have switched off the last nuclear power plant. And we had this discussion in the group. We talked long and hard. Basically, every week we had three or four meetings, and I had a living document, as we call them. That was an embryonic report. First of all, it was just a structure, and then there were some quotes to fill it, and then we had the first wording of the text, and then there was a report. And that living document is something that all the participants in that group regularly received and then they were able to respond to it and tell me what I had to put in it. I would record all that, sort it, work out what we could meaningfully put into the report, what would be a dissenting opinion, what would be consensus. And then that had to be signed off 
by the Ethics Commission Chair, and then it would come back into the task force. So organizing that process of achieving consensus, given the very different points of departure of the participants under time pressure, that was my task. The way you tell us that, since about 2002, Germany has a national sustainability strategy. Today, the report by the WWF was published, and according to that, Germany doesn't appear to have turned the situation round. Why is that? Yes, to reverse the trend. In some points, we have been successful. More people are buying organic food than ever before. We have an intermodal approach to public transport. People use bicycles, rail more than ever before. We have also the of renewable energy. With the additional creation of renewable energy capacity, the speed we've achieved that with breaks all records, I think. But it's not enough to reverse global trends. You're right. The trends are towards destruction of the environment, which is also to the detriment of the human race, the way we are going about growth now. We have to consolidate what we've achieved. So the task remains. We can look back on some positive effects, and we can also look back on some positive learning effects. We shouldn't regard sustainability simply as a new approach based on technology or growth generated. We have to look at opportunities for people, including for people in the south of this planet. So from that point of view, both sides are right. The WWF has said quite correctly, the world as it is living now needs two to three planets, but we've only got one, so we have a problem. Just like Karlowitz said in Saxony back then, and the sustainability strategy here in Germany says, we have some positive signs here, we can achieve things, but it's not enough to remove our head from the noose. So we have to keep going and work with partners in other countries. And we have to do a lot more so that those seeds we've sown in Germany with our Council for Sustainable Development, our decision makers at all levels, looking at these sustainability issues, proving to people that we can do it and saying to people, this is where you could go about this. In the world, at the United Nations, we're now talking about sustainable development goals for the world as a whole, which apply to everyone. And I hope that within a year, we will have a resolution on that. And then we'll go and look and say, OK, let's have a target in order to eliminate food waste. And starvation too, but it would be fantastic if we could get rid of both at the same time, the waste and the starvation. There may be a benefit in this. So from that point of view, the task remains. And all the things I've described to you are only beginnings, positive beginnings. I would certainly admit they may be inadequate, but that's where we've got to. And if you want to move ahead, you have to look ahead and not fall back. Certainly. You've told us a lot of interesting things, in particular, one really important thing that you almost said marginally, you said the contribution of every individual is important. And now we're almost at the end of our interview. I'd like to invite you to offer our users something from you. What is important to focus on? What must we work on so that issues like sustainable development can be moved on, can be spread? I would say to your users, to your viewers, think of freedom when you think of sustainability. Think about all the things you can liberate yourselves from. Pressure, being reached all the time. Pressure of work, but also habits. 
that are based on a destructive attitude, destruction of the environment. You can free yourself from these things. You have a better feeling if you know that the fashion articles you've bought are based on a fair wage and not the bloody fingers of underpaid seamstresses in Bangladesh. Free yourself from this, and to some extent that works. I don't want to talk down the role of governments and companies. A lot needs to change, to change the framework in which we are acting. But for us here in Berlin, in Germany anyway, there are plenty of opportunities to fill this idea of sustainability with life in our everyday dealings. It calls for an attitude. Knowledge too, but that's not so decisive. It's the attitude. The attitude will bring the knowledge. And the attitude has to be, let's look and see what alternatives we have. There are always alternatives. Because this idea there is no alternative. That is a drug. That is an opiate that is preventing us from moving ahead. Sometimes it's a bit difficult to work it out. Sometimes you have to go out there and look. If I want to buy a pair of jeans, what does that mean? Or if I buy a car, what are the implications? or a trip abroad, and you won't find a satisfactory answer to all your questions. But you need to ask the questions, you need to have that curiosity and say, what answers might there be? There's fun in that. And there's also the factor that you tend to work with other people on these. It leads to community. There are other people asking the same questions. I won't say like-minded people, that's the wrong word, but asking the same questions. And that is exciting. And I can only appeal to users and say, this kind of approach changes the world. Whether you can see that yourself in the evening of the same day, no. But whether at the end of your life you can say, I did what I could, I don't know. But that shouldn't be the yardstick. The yardstick has to be, did I try? And try, trying begins with questions. And I'd like to end on that note. Well then, one more question for you personally, because we've got this to everyone we interview. When you are working so closely with science, with the footprint, with all these issues, carbon and so forth, when you have so much to do as well with governments, you work closely with government, what do you think is the most important thing in life? Well, this sounds so highfalutin and I don't mean it in a highfalutin way, I have to say. And I'm shying away from the big words here, but I think the most important thing is that any cause you adopt, for example, fairness to other people, sustainability, justice, including global justice, that you can walk through life with your head held high without using the padding, without turning a blind eye, saying what you think, and it doesn't matter who to, whether it's in politics, in government, in parliament but also in a local council meeting here in the city. You have to be able to say your opinion. And freedom of expression is an important good in Germany, quite right, as federalism is, quite rightly, the federal principle. And so that we can do that, we fight for those freedoms through our parliamentary system, our political system. There are other people in the world who don't have that. And so this great value that we have built for ourselves through this democratic consensus, we have to make use of that. And that's important because that is what gives us the opportunity to think about alternatives and to express those alternatives and to live them ourselves rather than being fearful that as soon as you say alternative, you are going to be pushed out and made silent. That's what I try to do day by day and to some extent, never 100%, to do this myself. Thank you. Thank you for the interview, Dr. Bachmann.